Hello and welcome to this presentation about leading in times of crisis. My name is Gisli Olsen and I currently work as the Emergency Response Director of an organization called NetHope, which is a consortium of 41 of the leading uh, nonprofit uh, organizations around the world, uh, many of whom deal with disasters uh, and other types of crisis on a daily basis. I worked uh, in the uh, international disaster space for the last uh, nine years, uh, of which uh, part of those I was the team leader of Iceland's urban search and rescue team, uh, which I will mention a number of times throughout this presentation. Uh, in total, I've spent over 20 years in the field of disaster management uh, while at the same time uh, spending over 30 years in the technology sector. But I often joke about the fact that uh, most of the things I learned in uh, dealing with crisis, I learned from being the father of five wonderful children. But most uh, recently what I've done is, is write a book and that book is called The Crisis Leader uh, and it's available on Amazon and a lot of the things that I will talk about uh, in this presentation are items I touch uh, and talk about in this book. So let's start by talking about crisis. Uh, it's a little easier in my world uh, to define what a crisis is, because for me, uh, it is usually a natural disaster or a uh, humanitarian conflict somewhere. And uh, we all can identify uh, when we see pictures like this one, uh, that this is certainly a crisis. But these kind of crises, although easily identifiable and big, are not the only types of crisis that I will be talking about. Because crises can come in various sizes and forms. Uh, another crisis that we had uh, in my home country of Iceland uh, was the financial crisis in 2008, where, as you can see in this picture, uh, protesters were burning things and, and fighting outside uh, of Iceland's parliament uh, because everybody had lost uh, a lot of their homes, their cars, and, and basically their standard of living. Uh, because of what a few bankers did. Speaking of private sector like bankers, uh, running a company uh, can lead to you being the one that everybody looks to to deal with a crisis. This is Tony Hayward. He was the CEO of British Petroleum or BP as it's better known. And for those of you who remember uh, the uh, news a couple of years ago, he had a minor little problem in the Gulf of Mexico uh, when one of his oil platforms uh, blew up in, in, in a big ball of fire and lots of oil started leaking into the Gulf of Mexico. And a lot of critics came after how he led the company through this and as a result he lost his and we can ask ourselves you know is the best thing to do maybe to uh simply put our head in the in the sand and uh ignore what's going on around us and hope that the crisis will go away <sighs> not really and that's what we're going to talk about in in this presentation how you can better deal with the crisis in your future. And I'm going to focus on it from the point of view of leadership, because it's been said that it is in times of crisis that true leaders emerge, because it's in those times that you really, really have to leverage all of your leadership abilities to really get things done and to get everybody to work with you on dealing with those things that need to be done to get through this crisis. Now, B 
being a geek and the son of a mathematics uh, uh, teacher, of course I have a formula for crisis leadership. And the formula is that crisis leadership is equal to you and your preparedness plus your team and your team's preparedness and how you respond to the crisis. So let's start with you. One of the key things for you as a leader is to know yourself. Understand how you will react to things around you. We all experience emotions and especially in times of crisis, those emotions can really either disarm us or enable us to do better things. Fear is an emotion that can really disable you. And if you understand how you are going to react when things happen and how you can control your fear, that is going to be a crucial aspect of getting through a crisis. And you can mentally prepare yourself to deal with the various kinds of fears and work your way through those scenarios in your mind so that when those things happen, you know how to deal with them. Because it's all about preparedness. It's about understanding your mental and emotional reaction to the various emotions and to go through them and understand why they're occurring and what you can do to lessen their impact, especially if it's an impact that would, will disable you from doing what you need to be doing to move things forward. But it's not enough to simply prepare mentally. You also must prepare yourself physically. I have seen this so many times, including with myself, where I've been able to get through the first few days of a difficult crisis, but when I get a little bit of breathing room to go back and, and, and have go away from the uh, endorphins and the uh, adrenaline that's pumping through my body, all of a sudden, parts of my body start feeling aches and pains that I don't understand why. And in a recent big natural disaster, I saw one after another of the responders just coming down with some kind of a flu, even though they had no flu. It was simply their body saying after two weeks of working like crazy, stop, I need a rest. So the more fit you are, the better you are in responding and keeping yourself moving forward. And you will un also get an understanding, just like with your mental fitness, your physical fitness will help you understand how far you can push your body before you reach that breaking point. Another crucial thing that I strongly believe in, but I feel is very often overlooked, is the importance of preparing your family. Because you may be the one going out and deal with the crisis, but you are leaving behind your family, which still needs to function, still needs to be going through their normal life, but now without you being there to help them. And I've been extremely lucky because I have the most understanding wife in the world who stands as a rock behind me every time I jump on the next plane to the next disaster. And having her 
be able to take over and keep things moving enables me to go ahead and, and deal with the disaster at hand without having to worry about what's happening at home. I am confident in the fact that things are moving ahead there as they need to be. So now that we've talked about you and your preparedness, let's talk about your team. One of the key things to making your team effective in a crisis is to build up resiliency in the team. What do I mean by resiliency? Resiliency is the ability to deal with difficult situations. And it's quite interesting because it's been shown that any investment we put into building up that resiliency will be paid back six times. The World Bank got some of the leading Nobel Prize winners in economics to write a report about the where they investigated the importance of building resiliency and preparedness against natural disasters around the world. And what they found was amazing. They found that for every dollar spent on preparedness, six dollars were saved on response. And I firmly believe that the ratio is the same when it comes to time. For every hour we spend on preparedness, we are saving ourselves six hours in response. And the key to being resilient is planning. When we responded to the earthquake in Haiti, we had just spent two years really building and exercising plans of how to respond to an earthquake anywhere in the world. And what that meant was that when the call came on January 12th, 2010, everybody knew what their role in the plan was. And as a result of that, we were able to respond more quickly than any other international team around the world and we landed before any of them in Haiti. And that was all because of the effort we put into planning and making sure that everybody knew their role. Well, maybe not him. But it's not enough to have plans. You need to exercise those plans. And that's what we did. We did exercises. Some of them were desktop exercises where we sat around a table and we talked about a scenario. We talked about how we would respond to various conditions that might come up and what we would do. But some of them were actually going out. And in the case of urban search and rescue, where it's all about breaking through collapse, uh, walls in collapsed buildings, we actually had to go out and know exactly how to do each one of those tasks. And we did a big major exercise just a few months before uh, the Haiti earthquake hit. And that enabled us to really respond very quickly because we had just exercised exactly that kind of a scenario. But another key to building up your team is to build up a team of leaders need to build up a team of people you can trust will be able to take things forward without you having to micromanage them. The key there is empowerment. You need to empower those people in doing their role and becoming world class at what they do so that you do not have to become an expert at everything because you can trust those people to be leaders in that particular field. Me, for example, I do not know the exact way urban search and rescue works. 
I know it's about getting people out of collapsed building. I know that you need to break through in a safe manner through a wall. I know that you need to search, but do I know how to use a particular um, tool to break through there? No, I empowered my team to become the experts at that so that I did not have to do that. And I had experts and leaders that I could trust to take that task on and take their role on and move that forward so that I could work on the overall goal. I could work on making sure the team itself would get good, good things to work on and we would keep morale high. So those are the keys to building a resilient and ready team. But how we actually respond is also a key to leadership. And I love this old poster. It actually dates back to World War II. And it has a crucial message, which is whatever is going on around you, the key for you is to keep calm and carry on with what your role is. It is so easy to give up. And we saw that during the uh, financial crisis in Iceland, where some of the ones who were supposed to lead us through simply gave up. Some of them had nervous breakdowns, other became catatonic and just simply did not function. But those that kept calm and kept working at what needed to be done were the ones who got us through that crisis. And the key to doing that is focus. Diane Nyad, an amazing woman in her 60s, swam between Florida and Cuba with sharks, and jellyfish and bad weather all around her. But what got her through was her focus. She had only one thing in her mind and that was to keep on swimming. No matter what was going on around her, she kept on swimming until she reached the shore. The same applies during a crisis. You need to focus on your role, your task, what you need to do to get us through this crisis. Because as soon as you start letting your focus wander to other things, what you will discover is that your mind will move towards those things and you will stop working towards that particular goal. Another thing which is very key to responding is actually goes against what often has been said. It's often been said that you should keep a distance from what's going on. But I learned an important lesson from Rich Serino, uh, the former deputy director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA who deals with crisis in the US. Every time he goes to a disaster zone immediately after a crisis strikes or a disaster strikes, he goes and meets with the people affected because it's the people affected that can tell him what they need, what they believe needs to be done. And he told me a story of how during Superstorm Sandy, he went to a shelter late in the night after meeting all of the mayors and the governors in the affected areas. But he said, what I got most out of was that meeting in the shelter where I got input from those affected that changed the way they, the federal government responded to the superstorm. And for that, he reached out to the people affected, not to the politicians, not to the other leaders, not to the media, 
but those affected. So every time you're dealing with a crisis, walk out of your ivory towers and go and meet with those who are affected. During a crisis, the effectiveness of your team will be directly linked to the morale within the team. And as a leader, it is your role to focus on keeping morale high. You will have various external influences affecting the team and creating issues that cause morale to go down. You need to focus on shielding your team from some of those external factors and enable them to focus on their task and their role. It is that key thing that will either make your team go through a crisis effectively or not. And one of the proud things I'm most proud of from leading my team to, through the Haiti earthquake was that we kept a constant focus on morale and we worked on enabling them to do their work as best as possible even though the conditions all around us were some of the worst we and everybody else has experienced. And during crisis especially when morale starts to wander, you will experience stress. But if you know yourself well, like we talked about earlier, you will know when that stress starts to build up and you will have found ways to alleviate that stress before hell breaks loose, you start looking like this guy here. Now we need to vent every once in a while, uh, but we need to do it in a way that's controlled so that it does not affect the task at hand that we all need to work on. So in this short presentation, I've tried to give you some of the key things that you need to work on. You need to ask yourself, are you ready for the next crisis? If you like to learn more about some of the things that I have mentioned in this short presentation, I highly recommend that you read my book, The Crisis Leader. It's available in paperback and in Kindle ebook format on Amazon.com. And I also encourage you to reach out to me either through Twitter or through email and tell me what you thought about the book and what you thought about some of the things that I mentioned in it around how to lead in times of crisis. Thank you.